Greetings, everyone. Welcome again to another edition of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program Teacher Certification Course. Glad you're joining us wherever you are. Please be seated if you're here at the headquarters in Abilene slash Clyde, Texas. Wherever you're joining us from afar, you can also please be seated. Get out your pens, pencils, paper, your peaceful solution books. If you're joining us online, you can go ahead and download the, the manual at the top of the Facebook page. There's a drop down menu and it has, we're on the fifth manual, the uh, responsibility unit. We'll be in chapter seven tonight, starting a new chapter entitled, You Can Be Responsible for Your Safety. And uh, I think it's a really timely subject. Um, it's a lot going on in the weather and uh, you know extreme weather patterns and things we've been seeing. Chris kind of gave you a preview of some of the things that we're gonna be talking about uh, in this chapter, but there's a couple things that I'd like you to do uh, to rehearse, you know, for the chapter, it would really would not hurt if you would go back and either read chapter seven, I would say both, uh, if you could read chapter seven of the self-control unit, self-control in the environment, uh, and couple that along with the, the videos that we, that we, uh, the classes that myself, Katan, Chris, and David uh, put together the information in those in that class regarding uh, the treatment of the environment and why we're having the difficulties we're having on this planet because you know these things are man-made <laughs> uh, you know uh, okay I got a goofy fly up here now um, these things are really avoidable okay believe it or not you know you think you know what do you mean earthquakes are avoidable what do you mean uh, 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 extreme weather patterns are avoidable you know that's nature that's mother nature as they call it you know and uh, you know we can't control those things well uh, to a certain extent yes we can <laughs> and a lot and we're gonna be learning about that we're gonna be learning man I hope this guy goes away at some point <laughs> uh, they really uh, are annoying um, uh, we're going to be learning that, yes, we can avoid these things, and yes, mankind is bringing these things upon themselves because of the lack of moral character education that we're learning in the Peaceful Solution Program. And you won't learn this anywhere else. I told you a few months ago, when I, I think when we were in Chapter 7, that many have tried, you know, to uh, uh, teach character education they, they tried with the best they know how um, but no one's ever come close to being able to explain it the way uh, Yisra Hawkins the author of the peaceful solution explains it and goes into the detail uh, <laughs> details that you know I like even tonight we're going to be talking about responsibility and your safety and you know how many children are learning about you know preparing for tragedies you know how, how many are, are, you know, other than possibly doing uh, uh, fire drills at school or, you know, they do active shooter drills or, you know, things like that sometimes. But other than that, no one's really thinking about nuclear war and other terrorist attacks and things that could be on the way, which will, we will see these things take place. You know, we can't think that they're not going to occur to us. You know, um, and we'll be talking about all those things and we'll be putting it together with the moral character so you can see how it all ties in. <laughs> um, all right, so anyway, I'm going to have to deal with this fly, I guess, for, for the hour. Uh, hopefully the time flies. <laughs> okay, so anyway, let's go ahead and um, let's do a little... Let, I'm going to go back. I wanted to talk a little bit about the last chapter before we go on. I wanted to... Because uh, I was watching everyone, uh, you know, uh, Katan, Chris, and David, which they did an excellent job in explaining and going over these uh, things about the prisons and, uh, you know, how they're not working and how you know they don't work. You know, prisons, uh, how you gauge 
whether something's working or not is, you know, like in the peaceful solution, we gauge a person's uh, uh, knowledge and understanding based on how they behave, <laughs> right? Um, if we see the changes and we know that it's being, that they're actually putting it into practice. Well, it's the same thing in the prison system. If you don't see any changes in their behavior in these correctional facilities or correctional institutions, then you can bet that it's not working. Okay, and if you could put up the first slide, I could probably give you an idea. You know, first of all, it, it's really difficult to explain to somebody that's never been in prison what some of these prisons are like. Okay, you know, uh, uh, like the sh like the shoe, for instance. You know, these uh, uh, these uh, special housing units in places like Lompoc, Pelican Bay. California, you know, these are these are places that you can't imagine the things that take place with human beings in these prisons. Um, but just put that slide back up, and I'll kind of give you a little bit of an idea. It says, you know, imagine a concrete room, not much bigger than a parking space, um, no windows. You're in there 23 hours a day, seven days a week, and you don't know when you're going to get out of that room. You don't know if you're going to be in there for a month, a year, a decade. And it says, our minds don't do well with that kind of solitude and uncertainty. Okay, you know, people have to do a lot to keep from going crazy in that kind of condition. In a box, no windows, oftentimes no AC, uh, cold in the winter, a thin blanket, a pillow that's flat. <laughs> they don't have pillows that have fluffy uh, foam and feathers in them, you know. They got hard plastic, if you get one, pillows. And uh, it's very, very uncomfortable. Um, and they try to make it so. They, they try to make it that way. But I want you to understand there's places that when the men go out on the prison yard, like in these kind of yards, in these uh, special housing units or shoes, um, they have to walk. They have to walk in the prison yard. They can't walk, clock, they can't walk counterclockwise. If they do, they can be shot. They have to walk in a circle in that yard, and they have to stay in that uh, clockwise circle as they're walking around that yard. And if they go the opposite direction, they'll get shot. Why? Because if they go the opposite direction, it's an indication they're getting ready to stab somebody. That's how uh, crazy these places are. Yes, men get knives, shanks, they call them, homemade knives, in the yard, and they storm in places that you would not believe to get them out there. This is what these people are facing on a daily basis. Okay, and now, like I said, I can't, this is a family-oriented program. I would that I could tell you everything that I know about what goes on. But just know, it's not a walk in the park in a lot of these places, these, these maximum security facilities. And they're not doing anything to help anybody become a better person. Okay? And let's go to the next slide, because I want to I wanna show you. This is from Western Michigan University. It says that the United States you know, has 5% of the world's population, but it incarcerates 25% of the world's people. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world in America, okay? And 70% um, recidivism, 70%. That means that in and within five years, when they get out of the prison, they come back. 
70%, that's 7 out of 10 uh, individuals, just to put it in another way, 7 out of 10 come back within five years. And I think they compared to Norway as something like, you know, 20% and other countries much lower than America. But in a, in a word, if you only have 70% of your students passing, or I mean 30% of your students that aren't coming back to your school, I mean that are failing, you're not doing very well. You better try something else, you know. And uh, But they're not wanting to try anything else. You know, the prison system, I think David mentioned, Chris mentioned, is a very lucrative business now. They're making money off telephone calls and commissary and, you know, uh, they're making money off people's misery, okay? Um, it's sad. I, I know people call me all the time and they're like, you know, I only got two minutes and it cost me $10 to make this phone call. You know, it's like, are you serious? Somebody's really ripping people off, you know? But that's what it's become. It's become a, a money maker, okay? Um, now let's go to the next slide. So when David and Chris and Catan were talking about what needs to be done, and they were talking about, uh, you know, uh, making a difference to change people's hearts and minds while they have them you know when when people are in prison they have a captive audience you know in other words they're not going anywhere so it's best to teach them while they have them to try to do something to help them because look if you don't educate them they're going to get out they're going to get out and guess what if you don't train them they're going to make bad decisions again they're going to they're and it could possibly your, be your family or one of your loved ones or one of your friends that becomes a victim of crime so there's a man that i met years ago he was a sheriff down in laredo texas he was a for, he's a former sheriff his name is rick flores he's a great friend of the peaceful solution uh for for his whole tenure as sheriff he had the peaceful solution in his jail and I'll let him talk about it so you can understand what, how it made a difference. And, and you know, Webb County Jail, you know, you're, you're dealing with cartel members and, you know, on the border. This is a border town. Um, the people that were coming to these classes, you know, these weren't, uh, these were some pretty rough individuals. But I want you to listen to his testimony that he gave a while back for the Peaceful Solution about his tenure as sheriff and what he did with the peaceful solution and the difference it made for him and hopefully it will inspire others to try it themselves so let's go ahead and play the video i have to use my spectacles i'm getting to the age where i need glasses you need more <laughs> first i might say that it's moving and satisfying to be in such a large room, but in large room of people who care. Uh, Mingo, where's Mingo? Mingo, you're my hero, man. You're my hero. One day a man was walking along the beach, and I know you heard the story. When he noticed the boy picking up something up, gently throwing it into the ocean. Approaching the boy, he asked, what are you doing? The youth replied, throwing starfish back into the ocean. The surf is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they'll die. Son, the man said, don't you realize there are miles and miles of beach and hundreds of starfish. You can't make a difference. After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish, and threw it back into the surf. Then, smiling at the man, he said, I made a difference one at a time. And that's why we're here.
Throughout my career, whether I was working as a correctional officer, adult probation officer, juvenile justice alternative education administrator, counselor for victims of domestic violence, sheriff, police chief, and currently as an educator in high school, I have always cared about helping people and attempting to make a difference. I would be remiss if I would continue this talk without acknowledging the people who at one time or another, and still from time to time, have shared their thoughts, personal tribulations, ideas, and advice. And now I can best, on how to best be a son, a brother, a father, friend, or a human being to others in the world we live in. I'm speaking of my parents, mis padres. Growing up, I remember my parents often telling me and my siblings the importance of character and reputation. My father would say, your character and reputation is your blueprint to your identity and how people will see you in society. He always made it a point to say that life didn't offer too many chances to correct that blemished character, identity, and reputation. He was right. In addition, I also remember that I didn't listen to my parents all the time. Nevertheless, it was good that there were others who offered the same identical advice, and I listened. I will always remember my positive brush with William Krauss. See, both William and I have a mutual friend. And it was through this mutual friend that we became into contact. When Sheriff, our mutual friend, would often visit Webb County's Waldorf Astoria, and that's what we call our jail, our friends swore up and down that Peaceful Solutions was a the program I was looking for to help inmates build or rebuild their character while in jail. William started character education at Webb County Jail, and within weeks, I received an overwhelming number of phone calls from families of inmates attending the program. Families were expressing their appreciation for a character education program. They were seeing and hearing a change in their loved ones. And of course, we did have some people who were skeptical and cynical of any program initiated to inmates at the jail. However, this program was different. People had experienced a character education program when jailed and now out and about in the community were personally visiting my office and praising the program. Throughout my tenure as sheriff and today, I often get stopped by people who profited by the Peaceful Solutions program while in jail, all saying great things about the program and William. Today, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Institutional Division is bursting at the seams with overcrowding. For this reason, County jails affected with congestion throughout the state of Texas must implement educational programs like those being offered by Peaceful Solutions. I truly believe these programs emphasize the importance of social responsibility and concentrates on parenting and family dynamics, cognitive skills, interpersonal skills, substance abuse education, and employability. These are the day-to-day -day strengths that help inmates positively face the challenges of independent living. As you know, my mission continues to make things better. If elected as your sheriff, once again, I will most certainly bring peaceful solutions back to the jail where it belongs. Yeah. Peaceful Solutions 
will help save one starfish at a time. I must say again, it's moving, satisfying, and an honor to be in such a large room accompanied by such great people who care. Thank you for allowing me to speak and be part of tonight's celebration. Thank you. So as you can see, you know, uh, as he testified, if you implement this program, you know, as he said, within weeks, you know, you can see a change. You don't have to wait years. You don't have to you know, wait, uh, you know, decades to see the change in people's behavior if they take the course and they start, it, it has a great effect on people, okay? So um, I'm hoping that others will take hold of it, that will listen to what the sheriff there said and take hold of these things. We could make a difference, we could turn this thing around uh, if we apply the peaceful solution everywhere. Okay, so let's go ahead now with that in mind, let's go ahead and turn to chapter 7. Um, lesson plan 7, you can be responsible for your safety. And um, that's on page 129. But of course, you know, we have to start in the uh, note to the teacher on lesson plan 7, page A. Lesson plan 7, page A, the note to the teacher. And uh, I do believe I have a visual for that. Yes, okay. For the people that are watching online. Okay, now, so chapter seven, you can be responsible for your safety. Note to the teacher. It says hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and terrorist attacks are only some of the disasters that can threaten our safety and security. Now, as devastating as these natural and man-made disasters can be, we do not have to sit idly by, powerless to protect our lives and property. We can accept responsibility for our safety, health, and well-being by taking the time to prepare before disaster strikes. Okay, and as we're going to learn, you know, the time to prepare is not when the disaster is taking place, okay? Preparation is always the key in everything that we do in the Peaceful Solution. We've, we've taught that since the character unit. Preparation's the key. You know, um, education is part of that preparation. It's the biggest part of that preparation. Education and moral character and, you know, laying the foundation of the moral character. You know, the, the self-control, remember the respect. All those things that we've learned, you know, we, we've got to build our lives on a solid ground. And that education and the peaceful solution is critical for everybody, for every man, woman, and child on the planet. Okay, so um, we can educate, it says, ourselves on what to expect from these disasters and then prepare ourselves and our families this is a responsibility that all people are encouraged to embrace, okay? All people are encouraged to learn to prepare for the unexpected. And really, what we need to really get in our mind is we need to expect the unexpected, you know? I'm not talking about going around all day thinking, oh man, you know, you know is there gonna be an earthquake today? Is there gonna be a, no. But be prepared, you know, be ready. You know, as we're gonna learn in this, this chapter, there's many ways that you can prepare and be ready so you don't have to worry and be anxious about these things because you, you've done what you need to do, to do and you've done all you can to prepare, okay? Um, and, you know, this is what I was saying about the peaceful solution. What's so great about it is, is what other character education program would even go into this? You know, teaching a child. Remember, this is, a, this is not an adult book that we're reading right here. This is an intermediate series book. This is a junior high, middle school book. So it's teaching middle schoolers. It's training them so they can in turn go home and protect their family. You know, they can teach their mom and dad, you know, what they learn from this and 
possibly motivate them to come up with a plan for different things. I know in my house when we were growing up, my dad was a, was a fire marshal. So there was a big emphasis all the time on fire, you know, being, being prepared, you know, being prepared for an eventual fire. And, you know, we did the drills, jumping out the window and, you know, where we were going to meet at after we got outside and, you know, all these different things, you know. And I'm glad we did that, you know, because it prepared us, you know. It, we, we, we knew what we needed to do in the event of an emergency, you know. Um, and I know we did other drills, I think, at school. I don't really quite remember. I don't, I don't think we were doing the duck and cover thing, you know, because uh, I think by then... The early 70s, uh, they, they kind of got out of that, uh, that uh, what, what would you call it, um, when that panic mode, you know, that Russia was going to attack us. Um, but, but we did do other preparation, other kinds of preparation, I'm sure. But, of course, now in the middle schools and high schools, they're doing these uh, active shooter drills even, you know. We're we're we're, di we're dealing with a whole different animal now in in the schools, you know, because we have many many school shootings take place. So you have to be, and even in the churches, they're shooting people in the churches. You know, people go to church and and they get shot. People go to the movie theater and they get shot. You know, these things take place. So you know, you've always got to be prepared for the eventual the eventuality of something like this taking place. You know, we're living in very uncertain times right now. We got, you know, uh, uh, the talk of civil war taking place, you know. We've got uh, 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 a wide open border where certain people are coming across that actually want to do harm to America. And there's, there's, there's talk about power grids being, uh, and some power grids have already been uh, sabotaged. Okay, where people uh, blow up uh, power stations to try and knock out electricity to hundreds of thousands of people. It's already taking place. You know, what else could take place? Could they, could, you know, uh, down in Laredo, we couldn't drink water for two months. You know, they, the water supply was, uh, uh, was, was contaminated. Okay, so we had to get water from somewhere else. Okay, these things take, there's so many different things that can take place, and you've always got to be prepared for, for anything. And we're going to learn about all those things. And we're not just going to skim over this chapter, okay? This is a very important subject right here, this, this preparedness, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and go to, uh, well, no, can I see the next slide? Because I don't even remember what, okay. All right, let me... I do know a little bit about earthquakes, for instance. You know, we're going to be talking about earthquakes in this chapter. I was only two years old, so I don't, you know, have a conscious memory of it, per se. But after this earthquake took place, I can tell you when I was living in Alaska, I could lay in bed at night or even I could, I could tell you at least 10 seconds before there was an earthquake. It was something in it was something in my subconscious or something going on where I could detect it before it even took place. And we we lived in Alaska with earthquakes that were often 6.0, 7.0. Those were like normal earthquakes. You know, where here it would just decimate buildings and destroy things. In Alaska, you know, they they're pretty rugged. They they learned to build on earthquake earthquake proof type uh, substructures, you know, where that roll with the, the, you know, roll with the movement of the earth's plates and things, but still, you know, they just, Anchorage, Alaska just had an earthquake not just four or five years ago that did quite a bit of destruction. I think it was 7.0 or something like that, but this particular earthquake that I was two, when I was two years old in Anchorage, Alaska was 9.2 on the Richter scale. 9.2 it's a, it's the largest earthquake in american history the second largest in world history i think the the largest was 9.3 or 4 in chile and i don't remember what year it was but it was pretty massive as well and there's been others you know back in 2011 you know we had the big uh, uh the, the fukushima disaster remember the the 311 2011 disaster in japan 
and uh, with the huge tidal waves and stuff. So I do have a little bit of knowledge of earthquakes because I lived in earthquake country and I knew what to do if there was an earthquake. And you pretty much just have to ride it out. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you, you can get under things and hide under things or whatever, but a lot of times you don't have much time to move and do anything because that room is, when you're in an earthquake, uh, it, it's like being in a box and somebody's shaking it, you know, back and forth and you know and it's it's sudden it's not something that you know like you know you have some kind of warning it's sudden it's sudden disaster okay so let's look at the slide because on march 27 1964 in anchorage alaska uh this 9.2 uh earthquake remember 10 is the highest <laughs> 9.2 lasted for 4.5 minutes four and a half minutes not four and a half seconds not just a minute of shaking four and a half minutes I remember asking my dad because my dad you know he was he was at the time he was in the fire department on on Spinard Road there in Anchorage Alaska and he said he said son the only thing I all I can tell you is that it looked like the earth was like I was in a like I was in the water like in the ocean and the and the waves were just going up and down and up and the earth was just moving like this four and a half minutes um, and only and it was at 536 in the afternoon I remember there was an old hospital that we used to go into you know, we used to trespass in places when I was young, but there was this old hospital. It was called Providence Hospital, and it got destroyed in the earthquake in 1964. And we used to go in there every day after school. You know, back then it was, you know, uh, 1969, 1970 when I was real young. And uh, we used to go in that hospital, and every clock that we saw on the wall said 536. Every clock just stopped time stopped at that time but that's what time and it was on a it was on a good Friday people were just getting off work uh, for getting ready for Easter Sunday I think is what they call it let's go ahead and look at the uh, slide again that's 4th Avenue in Anchorage Alaska that's a portion of uh, that sunk like you know 13 feet into the ground <laughs> um, Let's uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. I, got, I brought a little clip. It's only about three and a half minutes long. I'd like to watch. It's called The Face of Disaster. You know, of course, back in the 60s, we didn't have, uh, you know, the cell phones like you got now, you know, where people could do all these filming and things. But, you know, of course, they did have movie cameras and things, so they d were able to document, a few, uh, you know, some things. And... Um, there's many documentaries online regarding uh, this earthquake. But let's just watch this short clip of the 1964 earthquake. It came without warning, as most disasters do. In the Gulf of Alaska, all the fishing trawlers were heading home, tying up for a long Easter weekend. In Valdez, the freighter China had just come in. First visit of spring, and all the kids flocked down to the dock, knowing the deckhand would line the rail and toss them fruit and candy. And Fred Newmare, one of the crewmen, unlimited his 8mm movie camera to take these pictures. For the youngsters, the day wore a happy face. Until suddenly, at 5.36, the earth trembled, began to shake. Out in the Gulf of Alaska, the ocean bottom plunged, then heaved upward a full 50 feet, and a wave started racing for shore. It smashed into Valdez, tossed the China high in the sky, then drove the ship into the heart of town. Fred Numer, 
grabbed a deck stanchion, held on for dear life and kept his camera running. No one caught on the pier survived. The longshoremen, the kids, or their dogs. The seismic wave roared on into Kodiak Harbor, turning the town into a whirlpool of boats and buildings. At Seward, it exploded the gas tank, sending the people racing for their lives as a wall of fire and water swept through the town. In Anchorage, Alaska's largest city, the quake ripped directly through the downtown district. have stopped at 536. And so has everything else. Alaska has been hit by a natural force equal to 10 million atomic bombs of the size that leveled Hiroshima. The greatest shock to hit this continent within the 20th century. On 4th Avenue, the whole side of the street has dropped a dozen feet. At Turnigan, by the sea, the fashionable suburb just southwest of the town, the whole bluff has skidded, collapsed out toward the bay. And 150 homes have gone with it. 50,000 square miles have been ripped and torn by the quake. The Alaskan Railroad looked like this. Seward the morning after, after shock and fire and six tidal waves. <clears throat> so uh, one thing that that gentleman said that should you should try to remember, he says, uh, he talked about it was 536 when, when disaster struck suddenly as it often does. It often strikes suddenly. You don't even know it's coming, you know. But you can certainly prepare. You, you might not be able to stop the earthquake itself, but you're going to be able to, to, to have what you need after the eventuality of an earthquake. Because as you know, you're not just going to be readily able to get supplies. You know, a lot of the structure of the city's destroyed, you know, the water's not working, there's no electricity, and that was in the middle of winter, you know, as it, toward the end of winter in Alaska, so it was cold, it wasn't warm outside. So anyway, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, in the second paragraph on Lesson Plan 7A, it says, because the threat of danger from both natural and man-made disasters dominates the headlines, even children are being taught how they can take responsibility for their safety and to share their knowledge of disaster preparedness with their families. This final lesson is designed to help students become familiar with various types of disasters and the best way to respond in order to save their lives. You know, not only their own lives, but the lives of their families, their friends, and others, you know. I, I think it's, it's, you know, it really stuck out to me that, uh, in the, uh, that the author had the foresight to put this in, uh, this particular subject, in the responsibility unit this preparedness. It's just not something that, that a lot of people are, I think more people nowadays are starting to think about, they call them preppers, you know, they make fun of them, you know, preppers because they like to store up, you know, canned items and gas masks and, uh, you know, uh, what do you call them, uh, first aid kits and, you know, all these different things, uh, food storage. Um, but, you know, I don't call them, uh, Preparation is smart, okay? You need to be preparing. You need to be storing water. You need to be store food. You know, you need to have these things. You know, I would say at least a 30-day supply on hand, you know, for your family. 
um, and depending on how large your family is, you know. Um, but to teach children to do this is really a great blessing that, that, that you know, uh, the Peaceful Solution offers the schools, you know, because uh, children really enjoy this type of subject, too, and learning these types of things and then sharing them with other people and going home and talking to their parents about them. So, make, so their parents can start being uh, influenced to also start preparing themselves. So let's look at the next slide for the people online. So we're going to learn in this particular chapter, it says concepts that will be covered in this lesson are basic necessities and their importance to our survival. We're going to be learning about the basic necessities we need. And yes, you know, toilet paper, <laughs> you know, a bug out bag you know, with, you know, the, the uh, emergency supplies like, you know, batteries, radios, uh, you know, shortwave radios, uh, uh, some kind of light, you know, lamp light, some kind of flashlight, etc. You know, canned, canned uh, items, uh, non-perishable items that you can eat, uh, even water, uh, uh, some kind of water. Um, these are all things that we're going to need to be uh, to be storing up to be prepared for these things that are going to take place. They're going to take place in our lives. Um, I guess what, what's the saying? Better to have, better to have than to not have, <laughs> right? Um, better to, better to, how do they say it? Better to not. Yeah, better to have not too much or too much than not enough or better uh, let me let me think about it <laughs> okay it'll take me 30 minutes to figure it out we're also going to learn the importance of being informed about changing conditions you know um, that's something that I've grown accustomed to in Texas I often look at my uh, if I see ominous clouds you know dark clouds or I see any kind of you know, if I see any kind of, uh, you know, weather that looks uh, threatening, I've learned to go on, uh, you know, to Google uh, Clyde, Texas weather and look for any kind of uh, uh, severe weather warnings, okay? And, you know, nowadays, you know, in a lot of towns, they have tornado warnings, they have sirens, or they have, uh, or you can just go online and you can, you can get accustomed to these, or you can download certain apps that give you warnings about certain things. Um, uh, so learning about those things as well is what we're going to learn about the importance of being informed about changing conditions. Also the extent of damages that can be expected from both natural and man-made disasters. You know, a one man-made disaster would be nuclear war, <laughs> right? Uh, that's a man-made. Um, because man made the bombs and man makes war because they haven't been taught moral character education. And if you think uh, that's not going to take place, um, I don't know if you know, if you've heard a man named Scott Ritter, I listen to him often. He's a, uh, I think he worked with the IAEA. He was a nuclear weapons inspector in Iran and uh, for America. And uh, he's extremely knowledgeable about uh, warfare or uh, current events with Russia, NATO, and, and, and American forces. And he's saying we could see something as soon as mid-June this year, is what he's saying. In fact, he's on a mission right now to go to Russia to try to talk to people and tell them, ma'am, this is not a great idea, because right now there's certain countries that are encroaching upon Russia. NATO countries that are uh, doing certain things that are making, putting fear in the Russian people, mainly the Russian leaders that have their fingers on uh, nuclear weapons and other weapons. Uh, just this past week, on uh, Thursday, when uh, President Trump was indicted on or convicted of 34 uh, different charges, at, in, in the corner of the, on the headlines, you know, it talked all about uh, President Trump being, uh, uh, you know, convicted of 34 charges. 
And as a little afterthought, right over here in the corner, it said, Biden approves military strikes in Russia. <laughs> so while they're distracting you with Trump, <laughs> with President Trump's uh, personal tribulations, uh, they're poking a bear who told them, if you do anything like this, you're, you're going to get, you're going to see nuclear weapons being used in Europe. Okay. This is how close something is. And if we don't take it seriously and we don't get busy now in, in preparation, we're going to be, you know, cause you got to think, even if it only occurs in a certain part of the earth, you don't think it's going to affect us here in some way, shape, or form? Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> so you better be prepared because when gas prices go up, <laughs> or oil prices, <laughs> and gas prices are $10 a gallon or whatever they might be, and the price of food skyrockets past what it already is now, and other commodities are not available. Uh, we already saw during COVID what took place with the toilet paper, for instance, right? Was it, was it easy to find a roll of toilet paper anywhere? <laughs> and, you know, that's something you need. You know, that's something that's needed in times like we're talking about right now. Anyway, let me get back to the slide. We're also going to learn in this chapter how to prepare an emergency kit. Um, and the importance of storing non-perishable food and non-food items. It says... Uh, I don't know that I have that last part. Can you go to the next slide? I don't remember what I had on it. Okay, don't worry. Just let me read the, le the bottom part before we go to that. It says, It is a fact that we are living in uncertain times, but we can take responsibility for our safety and teach our children to do the same. You know, we have a, we have a moral responsibility to do this, to prepare. Okay? And you know what? When you're preparing... Don't just think about yourself, <laughs> okay? Think about other people because you're probably going to have loved ones that aren't going to be preparing, so you might want to think about others as well, okay? Because not everyone is going to prepare, okay? And you also have to remember that in disasters, you know, like nuclear war or certain things that might take place, civil wars or anything else that could occur there's going to be people roving around looking for stuff <laughs> and w one thing you don't want to do you don't need to take martial arts class you don't need to go to the shooting range so you can learn to shoot you don't we don't we're not that's not the kind of preparation we're talking about here we're talking about what i just read in these in these points preparation you know food water uh, uh medical all these kind of things to prepare, but not prepare to go to war with somebody, right? Okay, we're trying to, we don't teach war in the peaceful solution, so don't go buying guns, don't be going buying knives, don't be, we don't need all, now you can get a knife for, you know, whatever you need to, you know, one of those um, Swiss Army knives or whatever, you know, to open cans or whatever you need to do, but we're, we're not advocating any of that, okay? We don't teach war in the peaceful solution, in fact, the reason we're having to prepare right now is there are people that aren't being trained in the peaceful solution that are going to go to war. Okay, they're going to go to war and there's going to be other people that are in the middle of it, right? There's always uh, innocent victims in the middle of all this when these parties go to war. You know, it used to be, um, it used to be when uh, two armies fought, they used to go out in the field somewhere, you know, and they clashed with each other and there was no civilians around anywhere, you know, they would just go at each other, you know, they'd just, you know, it's pretty crazy how they did it, but, you know, now, you know, look how they're doing it now, you know, they're hiding behind civilians, you know, they got, they got, they got, they got uh, their headquarters located in the basement of a hospital, you know, where they can be shielded by, you know, people that are laying in the hospital, where, well, guess what, they don't care if it's a hospital anymore, they blow it up. Okay, they don't care if it's a, a school or a, a mosque or whatever it is. They're going to blow it up. Okay, and have you noticed there's no relenting on this thing? They're going full bore. Okay, and we've got 
two hot, hot wars going on right now in Ukraine and Russia and Gaza and Israel. These are hot wars that could spread in a minute worldwide, okay? Or at least entire regions, okay? But we need to be prepared and take this seriously. And I think that this chapter right here is so timely for all of us right now, you know, because we need to really get our minds on these things. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over to uh, lesson plan page 7C, and let's look at the uh, lesson plan. You can be responsible for your safety. The purpose and objective is students will explore examples of both natural and man-made disasters. They will learn ways they can be responsible for their safety during a disaster, and also the safety of other people. In the proceed, you're going to need a student handbook for this chapter and the materials. And the procedure one, let's go ahead and put up the slide. Procedure one says, review the previous lesson, Responsibility in Society, by asking students to, I don't know why that's up there. Do I have that out of order? Is there a procedure one before that? Oh, okay, I don't have one. Okay. Keep that down for a minute, okay? I'm going to read this. I, did, I thought I had one on there. So review the previous lesson, Responsibility in Society, by asking students to list some ways that irresponsible choices or acts can affect our society. And some of the answers you're going to get from your students, or you should get from your students, to gauge whether or not they were paying attention and what they've been able to uh, retain. Some of their answers should be uh, risky behavior like drinking and driving, theft and sex offenses, making negative changes in people's lives. Those are what some of the ways that irresponsible choices can affect the society. They can also cause sickness. You know, our choices can cause sicknesses like STDs, pain, suffering, death, and higher cost of living. Many prisons, jails, boot camps, etc. must be built and ran in order to curb the constant rising crime rate. Okay, and we've already learned that this, you know, those things don't work. You know, for the most part, they really don't work. 30%, I think the 30% of the people that actually don't come back, uh, a lot of people, there's some people when they go the first time, they're like, you know what? I, I don't need to go back a second time, man. I learned my lesson. I'm not interested in that. You know what I mean? And, uh, but they also better themselves while they're in there in some way shape or form okay and uh i know usually the first thing people do when they go to jail is they pick up a bible you know and they start reading their bible or some kind of self-help book you know and think how where did i go wrong you know and uh they try to better themselves in some way a lot of people go to religious services when they're in jail and um uh, because deep down inside they're looking for something you know, they're looking for something to help them not to make these choices anymore. You know, because now they see what they've, you know, what's what's taken place, you know, in their life. And now they're like, oh, okay, you know, it's kind of like when something's broke, you know, you wait till something breaks and, if, you know, then you, then you got to fix it. That's what I love about the peaceful solution. It's called preparedness, you know, getting the education in advance so you don't get broke in the first place where you have to get fixed. But if you're broke, we can fix you too, right? People can get fixed, all right? There's nobody on the face of this earth that can't be fixed with the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program. I don't care who they are. I don't care if it was Adolf Hitler, you know, or Saddam Hussein or whoever they think the worst of the worst was, which really, they weren't the worst of the worst. Okay, they were trained in war just like everyone else. They thought killing their enemies was okay because they were taught it was okay. You know, they were trained in warfare. Well, we're not trained in warfare. We're trained in peace fair. Okay, peace, there's two trainings. You're either trained in peace or you're trained in war. Your children, your choice. Education and peace, education and war. Your children, your choice. Okay, now we choose in the peaceful solution because we've already seen what the other way brings. We just read them, sickness, disease, suffering, pain, agony, distress, 
hurt, death, war, divorce. Does anybody, I mean, do you think people are really enjoying this? The world is actually crying out for some kind of relief, you know, like, like, what do we do? What do, how do we get out of this mess that we've got ourselves into? You know, but like Rick Flores, Sheriff Rick Flores said so eloquently about the starfish, you know, it's the same thing the Peaceful Solution teaches. We can make changes one individual at a time, one individual at a time, one life at a time. But where does it begin? Who does it begin with? It begins with us. Peace begins with me and you. The choices we make, you know, taking what we learn in the peaceful solution and actually applying it with one another in our inner day interactions and sharing it with other people. And believe it or not, people will watch what you're doing and they can learn from what you're doing. And they'll come to you and they'll say, hey, I noticed there's something different about you. How come you're not joining in everybody else's reindeer games? You know, how come you're not picking on that guy when everybody else is? How come you're, how come you're uh, staying neutral? Like Sweden used to do. Remember, Sweden used to be a neutral country. You know, I used to really admire Sweden, you know. But now, guess what? They want to join NATO. I think they already have. And they're wanting to attack Russia now. They were never involved in these wars. <laughs> yeah, you know... I don't think people understand they don't really want nuclear war. I don't think they even understand what they're saying when they open their mouth and say nuclear war. We're going to use a nuclear bomb. But you know that earthquake, that Alaska earthquake, it said it was 10 million Hiroshima bombs all at once. 10 million, the power of 10 million Hiroshima bombs. Well, guess what? I'll just give you a little hint. That 9.2 earthquake was not a natural disaster. It wasn't a natural disaster. It was the result of our behavior. Nuclear weapons. I'll give you a preview of the next class. And in fact, I'm going to give you something you need to do before the next class, if you can. There's two documentaries I want you to watch. Write this down. They're both about an hour long. They're both hosted by William Shatner, Star Trek fame, who's a great narrator. I think he's one of the best narrators. I love listening to him. He's just got a great voice to listen to. But the first one's called Trinity and Beyond. Trinity and Beyond. The second one is called Nukes in Space, the Rainbow Bombs. Nukes in Space, the Rainbow Bombs. Those are two documentaries that are online that you can watch for free. Uh, just search, search, do in your search engine. These will prepare you to see What's taking place with the earth? What mankind is bringing upon this earth and has brought upon this earth and why the earth is in such distress right now. That'll get you prepared. So if you can watch those, it would really be the, worth your while. Okay? Uh, there's nothing in them that's, uh, that's uh, offensive in any way at all. But they're extremely educational in, in seeing how man has progressed from those, you know, I remember uh, the 1800s, those little bottle rocket things they tried to shoot up to these huge uh, ballistic missiles now that can get, that can go from point A to point B in 30 minutes to an hour and destroy whole cities. Just watch the progression. Just watch how they've gone back and forth the tit for tat between these countries in their race for domination over one another and what it's about to bring upon mankind you need to watch those documentaries again uh trinity and beyond and nukes in space the rainbow bombs okay so you can see 
the uh, underground, above ground, and atmospheric nuclear test nu nuclear testing that they've been doing, and you can start to prepare to learn about some of the results it's going to bring. So at the, this time, the next class, I got to end uh, the class now, but the next class will be on 6-5-2024, Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, it's been great uh, being with you this evening. We'll see you next time.